James Bell didn't get very well. <laughs> you can see the key which I did next. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I really didn't expect so many people to come. Let's hope it's a lively night. We could go back to the 1960s and ask this question because this was a question that bubbled up a lot in the late 50s and in the 1960s. And in a way, there was a revolution in our understanding of mental illness at that point, partly from the treatment side. Back then, mentally ill people were in straitjackets, locked in padded cells, there were schizophrenics, there were asylums, there was the healthy people outside, big walls that were like prisons. If you went to a mental health institution of some kind, um, the staff would be wearing almost like prison wooden outfits. And the patients would be, you know, <coughs> wearing something like patients' outfits. But in the 50s and 60s, there was a revolution in treatment, and it really started to change how we treated mental illness and thought about mental illness. And we'll get back to that a bit later, but it, but it suffice to say that at the time, typical 1960s kind of thing, if you went to some of these institutions, it was very difficult to tell the difference between the patients and the staff. <laughs> Okay, so, so the answer to the question from that perspective was, well, sure, we're all, we're all mentally ill because you can't distinguish the patients from the staff, so everybody's mentally ill. Well, how am I going to approach this question? I'm going to approach this question indirectly. We could go back to the 1960s and get ourselves involved in the debate that was had back then, and I don't propose to do that directly. What I want to do is two things. I want to ask, are we all ill? Look at that and then try and use the debate about are we all ill to cast light on are we all mentally ill. And I want to highlight a dimension which wasn't present in the 1960s debate about mental illness, which was, they were just worried about who, you know, some people would say, well, yeah, we're all mentally ill, and some people would say nobody is mentally ill, and some people have the intermediate positions. But there wasn't an issue then to do with things like the mental health crisis that we seem to be having Today, it seems that mental illness is more prevalent. Okay, and that's the dimension that I'm particularly going to focus on in the talk today. Illness is more prevalent, we'll get to that in a second, and mental illness seems to be more prevalent. Why is that? Because a better understanding why mental illness is or seems to be more prevalent will give us a bit more of a bite on understanding the nature, scope, and source of mental illness in all its different varieties. So I found this lovely quote from, I don't really know, Clifton K. Beaver, writing in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1994. I guess he's some kind of enlightened doctor. Well, people are disappearing. I should have known it when the invalids became extinct. Invalids disappeared shortly after the advent of Medicare, in America, which demanded specific diagnostic labels, even though none applied. However, I began to realize what was happening only a year ago at a dinner party. You can tell which class is from. Everyone there had something. Several had high cholesterol levels. One had borderline anemia. Another had a sus suspicious pap smear. Two others had abnormal treadmill test results. And several were concerned about codependency. Aren't we all? There was no <laughs> help After that, I began to look more carefully. See, we're all ill. I have not met a completely well person in months. At this rate, well people will vanish. As of the extinction of any species, there will be one last survivor. My guess is that the extinction will occur sometime in late mantle. <laughs> Before we can speculate about the last well person, we need to understand what is happening. Why are they vanishing? Now you can sort of tell from the tone of that he's a little bit tongue in cheek about this. But he's also deadly serious. He's a medical practitioner uh, who wants to understand what's going on. So let's take, take the question seriously. Why is the prevalence of illness growing? Why are well people vanishing? Those are Mida's concerns. Background worry, well, we're over pathologizing. We're, we're making out that some sort of healthy, normal, everyday events and addictions and things that befall our bodies are not really illnesses, we're over pathologizing, we're finding disease and illness and disorder where really there isn't any to be found. So that's the background worry. So let's just transpose that to the mental illness debate and ask, 
When, what year was the last mentally well person? 1998? Any, any guesses? 2019, after this lecture. Why are mentally well people vanishing then? Let's just transfer it to the mental illness case. Same worry. Are we over pathologizing? Are we finding mental illness where there isn't any? So that's the background to the tool. And you might think, well, I can understand readers worry, but maybe it doesn't transfer us across. Well, there is a mental health epidemic taking place. And by the way, if you want to email me with any links or information or research of your own that you've got, because I'm just collecting a huge store of uh, journalism and academic links to do with these topics to cover today. I, terrible referencing, no idea which edition of The Guardian that was. <laughs> and the shocking, shocking left wing rag that no one should ever read. <laughs> Sorry? 250,000 children are receiving mental health care in England. Okay, similar statistics for other uh, Western and indeed uh, countries in Asia too. Mental illness soars amongst young women in England. NHS finds 12.6% of women aged 16 to 24 screened positive for PTSD. 19.7% self harm. Wow, that's shocking. And 28.2% of a mental health condition. Actually, I think I have a rough idea where I pulled these down from about five years ago. So in fact, the statistics have gone up with respect to all of these things, and so the mental health crisis seems to be getting worse. These are shocking statistics borne out in other countries, and we haven't even listed, we just listed a few uh, conditions. So this is incredible. When I first came to the University, University of St. Andrews years ago, there were about five counsellors. Now I think there are about 28, 30. They have something like 200 free counselling slots a week. Okay, so let's try and understand this mental health epidemic here and elsewhere. Well, there are people who resist that an epidemic is taking place. They're going to say, well, is mental illness, we ask, ask the question, is illness more prevalent? Ask the question, is mental illness more prevalent? And they're going to say no. But these people divide into two kinds. A rather smug answer, in my view, is no, the prevalence is unchanged. As medical practitioners and mental health practitioners have just got way better at detecting it. So the level of mental health illness amongst the population at large has stayed stable, let's say, for 200 years, or let's say since the Second World War. What, we, what has changed is our knowledge of that prevalence. Why is that? Well, we've just got better at diagnosing the stuff that's out there. We've become better practitioners. Just like medicine is undergoing its golden age, some people think that psychiatry and mental health research and practice is beginning its golden age. Some people, of course, as we'll see, beg to differ. But that's saying, well, there isn't really, yes, there's a mental health crisis in the sense that we've discovered more mental health, but it was there anyway. It's not like something else causing this upsurge in mental health cases, it was, that was always there. Go back to the Victorian times and you could read accounts of mental illness in various people's diaries, but it wasn't kind of categorized or understood that way. A different no response is, sure, the prevalence is unchanged, but there's no change in the known amount either. These people are more skeptical, much more skeptical about the mental health crisis. They're thinking, yeah, come on, it's not really happening, or the real <coughs> practitioners haven't really detected any upturn, uptick in cases. So if, you, if you know mental health practitioners, you can't get them to agree on anything, because they all come from different schools of thought. Some are philosophers, so they just disagree interminably about things. Or you might think, well, the prevalence is unchanged because you're a kind of mental health nihilist, come back to those people later, you just don't think there's anything, any instances of mental illness at all. Well, let's look at the yes answers now. Here's a tiny bit of philosophy. By the way, there isn't much philosophy in this talk. It's just a kind of more of a pop philosophy talk. But this is a serious research area which philosophers are interested in. But here's the, here's the only tiny bit of philosophy really in the talk. You might say, look, there is indeed 
a change in the numbers of mentally ill people, change in the prevalence of mental health conditions. Now, why might that be? Well, it could either be because you've changed your concept or there's been a change in the world. So imagine if there are twice as many cars tomorrow. Well, it might be because overnight we've just manufactured an additional number of cars to make it twice as many. That's a change in the world. Or it might be that the Association of Car Definitioners have got together overnight and said, look, I think we should include tricycles as a car. <laughs> and I think we should include shores, <coughs> and we should include other things. What they've done is change the concept. Overnight, no more vehicles were manufactured, it just loosened the concept. So that's really <coughs> important in understanding the mental health crisis. It might be that there really is more of these symptoms around which are indicative of pathology. But what's happened is, there's none of that going on, there's just a relaxation of the concept. It's become a much more inclusive concept, perhaps even useless as a result. So one answer, of course, is are we all mentally ill? Might be yes. And in one sense, that might be gratifying because you think, phew, I'm not alone. Or in another sense, it might be non gratifying because it's like, oh, come on, you know, I really am mentally ill. I'm seriously mentally ill, as opposed to some other people who are now characterized as mentally ill who ought not to be. So, what is happening is there is a battle about the concept. Practitioners are trying to mold the concept. And it's an interesting question whether they can do that. Or it might be, we need to think on the other end of things, it might be that there's a change in the world, there's a change in the exhibition of these pathological symptoms. So of course, that's the philosophy, that's the philosophy bit, that's important because as a basic distinction then, in order to understand the mental health crisis, is it become, become really relaxed about the concept, and they're aging into the mental health world, or has the concept stayed fixed, and it's just there's been an explosion of instances of the concept, people exhibiting the property of being mentally ill. Well, in order to get better, a better grip on these issues, we need illness, mental illness, disease, pathology, syndromes, and indeed the, the contrary is health, we need to understand something called the medical model of disease. Actually, this is a very general model which is shared across various uh, traditions in healthcare, both East and West. I guess it appears in Hippocrates, Galen, and people like that. But the idea is, look, you exhibit some surface symptoms which indicate that there's some malfunction or disorder. You give a theory of those symptoms, that theory is called the symptomatology. There's an underlying condition which gives rise to those symptoms, which causes them. And the theory of that, pathology, sometimes pathology is used, the word pathology is used to refer to the illness itself, that's a mistake. It's the theory of the illness. And tractology uh, is the theory of treatment. Treatments can be curative, preventative, or palliative. In addition, there's something called etiology, which is an interesting phenomenon. That's a bit like, how did this pathology get to get inside the host? And that's very important when it comes to understanding mental illness. What's the etiology of mental illness? Medicine, I don't know if you know, was in a huge state of disarray before germ theory, which emerged with understanding of conditions like cholera and so forth. But before then, medicine was killing more people than it was saving. Medicine was a complete and utter mess. It was full of quacks and charlatans selling tinctures and curious cures. So it's only in the last 150 to 200 years that medicine has made any strides. And so the thought is, well, ordinary medicine has made some strides, what about the, the science and practice of mental health care? Sometimes we can understand the symptoms but not know what the pathology is, the underlying condition is. Sometimes we do understand the underlying condition but we lack a treatment. There are weird cases where we have a treatment but we don't understand the underlying condition. That's actually extremely common. Medical practitioners don't like to advertise that fact because it's a bit embarrassing. But in fact, Ebola is a case in point. There are effective treatments of Ebola using biologic agents, and we don't really know how they work. That's because we really lack very much of an understanding of the human immune system. Also, electroconvulsive therapy 
it still exists in British mental health care institutions if you suffer from persistent, untreated, suffer from untreatable depression. I know people who've had it. And uh, why does that work? Well, it's a bit like banging the television, right? <laughs> <laughs> Metaphors like God's a bit of a reboot. <coughs> That's meaningless words. There's, there's no theory. So there's an interesting case. So exactly what goes on in the normal illness case is of course going on in the mental illness case. So the question is, is the medical model of disease appropriate for mental illness? And people diverge largely on this. In fact, if you actually talk to speech therapists, they have the view that um, well, we need to rethink the medical model of disease because it's a bit too blame the innards of the patient as to why you've got some pathological condition. Well, there is a condition called um, teacher's throat, I think, which um, is, uh, speech therapists deal with. And they don't really look at that. Of course, there is some inner pathology with you, there's some malfunction in your vocal cords. But then what they, they ask you all sorts of questions, you go along with it, they ask all sorts of questions about your embodied state and the environment and your habits and <coughs> the pressures on you from society. And I spoke at length to a, uh, a practitioner about this and they say, yeah, speech therapists tend to play down the medical model of disease. The medical model of disease is very much, it's all about you as your inside bit. And what we'll do is we'll somehow find the underlying condition in here and in you. You are the locus of the disease. Things outside of you might be enabling conditions for that disease. There might be toxins or something in the air, but the disease is in you. I'm going to come back to this because uh, maybe we can question that. Disease, a uh, ta whole taxonomy and discussion of the nature of disease and mental health and mental illness is way beyond this talk, but one, one distinction is important is there are some very non-specific illnesses that you might get. Indeed, some people think they're so non-specific they're not really illnesses at all. If you get carditis, which is inflammation of the heart, you get sweaty, you get tachycardia, irregular heart rhythms, tiredness, and so forth. But actually, that's not really an illness. That's just a disjunction of more specific illnesses, namely myocarditis, endocarditis, pericarditis, bacterial, fungal, uh, parasitic, and so forth, and viral. And indeed, uh, you can get a kind of myocarditis so it's worth noting that one way in which medical science progresses is more terminology, more distinctions, more, more granularity, more getting into detail of the underlying pathologies which inhere in human beings. So let's look at some hypotheses which might explain the last well person and the last mentally well person, which might go some way to understanding uh, this alleged phenomenon, perhaps not, that there's an increase some, somehow or other in the prevalence of illness and indeed an increase in the prevalence of mental illness. Either through change of concept or through change of world or indeed both. Well, just with the distinction I've just given you about specificity, uh, the Greeks knew about carditis and indeed they, they said lie down and rest. And a lot of the time that is actually the best treatment for certain forms of carditis, not bacterial alas. But you, but the, uh, so specificity of treatment is, well, what we, what we shouldn't really individuate diseases and indeed mental health conditions, likewise, treat them on a par. We need to individuate conditions by the kind of treatments that work for that condition. So we get fine brain. So because I can treat something with antibiotics, <coughs> means that it's a very different kind of carditis. This is part of that rather uh, optimistic view of the mental health uh, prevalence increase. It's like, yeah, sure, probably there's as much illness around as there always was, much mental health illness. We just got better at that with our taxonomy, better with our theory. Here's the more general view. There's medical progress, and that's why we've just got better at spotting illness, we've got better at spotting mental illness. Of course, there's a kind of paradox there. We have got better at spotting it, haven't you? Why haven't you treated it and there should be less? So I can't quite, I can't quite get the whole story. You need to dig a bit deeper to make that stick. So those are the "Hey, don't worry too much" kind of answers. 
Another answer which is much more skeptical is, guess what, when it comes to illness, there are lots of spurious illnesses, and I mentioned it was only really the advent of germ theory where medicine started to become, started to become a fairly respectable discipline. Before that, it was a, pretty, it was a disgrace. It was uh, as bad as astrology. <laughs> um, so there was lots of quackery around, and indeed, one of the most famous examples of quackery is trapezomania. Does anybody know what trapezomania is? That's, that's a, a disease that only afflicted black slaves. It meant that they exhibited symptoms of trapezomania by running away. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how uh, Illness, and we'll come back to this, is often used for divisive, discriminatory, racist, <coughs> political ends. That was one of the, even at the time the person who proposed this as an illness was, was ridiculed. And the very fact that someone could, could seriously think this was a medical condition which somehow only afflicted black white slaves is quite preposterous. Another example is, maybe I'll put down somewhere, is nostalgia. Nostalgia was a condition, no darling. Reminiscing about the past terribly. Oh dear darling, you must have a case of nostalgia. <laughs> what do I take? <laughs> Stop reading <laughs> Bruce! <laughs> so, yeah, that's nostalgia. Overdiagnosis. Well, play on the safe side. So you go to your doctor, um, well, borderline case, but I better say you've got it because, you know, if you do have it, you'll die, so I better. So you've got it, you better treat it, and um, that's the way it goes. Of course, we know about side effects, and of course doctors know about side effects, and there are very few treatments that don't have side effects. You have mild ones, and one of the earliest Hippocratic, part of the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. So you better be careful when your medical practitioner is saying, oh, err on the safe side and say that you've got it so you can have this treatment, you might end up doing harm and not good. But certainly overdiagnosis is a potential explanation for the last well person, the last mentally well person. And over treatment goes hand in hand with that. Uh, of course, uh, we'll come back to this a little bit, but there are you know, maybe various benign explanations for over treatment. Again, are we better there on the side of caution versus more sinister ones? Uh, I know a medical rep, and he's always taking doctors and GPs out to lunch, shopping them to give a talk at a conference, whining and dining them, giving them pencils and calendars and all sorts of different things. Um, so, um, of course, they, those medical reps want you to prescribe their drugs. Of course, they want as much prescription as possible because therein lies lots of money. Come back to that. There's, an ace, there's a weird asymmetry between health and disease, or health and non-well-being. Health is often just defined in a negative sense, it's just the absence of disease. So, it's kind of, as me, I think this is in me, this paper that I read, you can't really screen for wellness, so I need to go along and work out whether I'm well. You don't go to the doctors for that, you always go to work out whether or not you're unwell, and if, if there's an absence of that unwellness, you're well. So that's the way you get to wellness. So it seems like maybe the one explanation for uh, there being an increase in uh, diagnosing illness, both mental and otherwise, is the also stacked in favor of illness over health. Some people have attempted more positive definitions of wellness, but um, you can see how problematic that might be. Fashion. So I've got nostalgia in there as a different case. At one time, gout wasn't a bad thing, gout was a great thing. <laughs> I think gout is like some kind of uric acid and crystallization in your blood and causes kind of horrible pain in your tips and your toes and stuff, um, in your extremities. Um, it was, you know, it was a, it was, you know, run with the hair and right with the hands. You, you, if, you were, if, you, if you were a certain heavy drinking, middle-aged man, ate too much goose fat, then you probably drink lots of pores and probably get gout. Um, and so it was a, you wear it as a badge of honor. And, it, and it's, so, so the idea is that some illnesses come out, uh, not illnesses at one time, but the other illnesses at a later time. Um, so one skeptical thought you might have about the mental health crisis 
This is just a lot of fashion, fashionable uh, labels that you can kind of wear um, in a certain way. Um, and indeed, you must be aware of these people that the skeptics will say, just a bunch of snowflakes uh, with a handy set of labels that they go to their doctor for, and you know they can kind of wear it as a badge of honor. Uh, a more diffuse diagnosis is, well, of course, at one time, if you weren't feeling too good, you confessed, or you went to your priest, or you prayed. Well, we live in a much more secular society, I guess, in the UK, so in Scotland. Um, so, in a way, there is a phenomenon of the doctor has taken over from the priest. Uh, you go, um, I'm not feeling too well, and somehow that ritualistic regular visit to your doctor somehow makes you feel better both physically and mentally. Someone is taking care of you, and that just makes you feel good. Malingering. Okay. Snowflakes, malingerers, you know, you're just pretending. Okay, malingering was a concept that was used around about the time of conscription in the First World War and the Second World War because we didn't want malingerers, we wanted as many people to sign up and get killed as possible. Uh, so, so the idea is, oh, well, if there's a kind of general crisis of mental health and health, it's to do with collective malingering. Actually, Meaden considers this and thinks that malingering is too consciously done. It's actually something you, you, know, you make a real effort, and it doesn't seem that that would explain the phenomena that we're interested in. So he, he considers uh, something that he calls this concept of borderline malingering. <laughs> I think I get this from me, I maybe got it from somewhere else. Um, and that the mental practitioners, I don't think we're really here today, but about the, the kind of methodology of how you deal with a whole panoply of different patients that come to your, say, your GP surgery. But I think it used to be the case that there was a kind of manual which said, you know, watch out for the malingerers <laughs> and watch out for, you know, Granny Green Apples who comes in every day and she just give her an aspirin and she's, she's happy with that sort of thing. <coughs> so there are people who come in with illness as a comfort for them. There is this type called the proud, lonely person who, you know, uh, has various Ill illnesses and ailments. The illness can be a hobby. There's another type called the Grand Tour type. It's a very Victorian thing that I need to go to Switzerland to a sanatorium, sit on the side of Lake Geneva. I'm, I'm, I'm on my Grand Illness Tour. <laughs> the chronic outpatient, generally poor, <coughs> making it to the doctor, but always making it to accidents and emergency. The eccentric hypochondriac, the kind of faddist, always looking in and finding different new things. The chronic convalescent. Illness as a profession, Munchausen syndrome. So there's, a, there's already a pre-existing kind of uh, list of types that when it comes to explaining the, the, the alleged prevalence of illness that you might think, oh, let's just deploy that set of existing types. Of course, there's going to be some truth in this, but it's a case of thinking, well, does that really get on top of the phenomena that we're interested in, um, certainly in the mental health case? Big pharma, big pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies are enormous, and they've, you know, apart from big tech and you know, big, big financial institutions, they really are the behemoths of the business world, um, earning billions and billions. But they've started to acquire, much as big tech has, a pretty grim reputation. The FDA in the US, the Federal Drug Agency, has absolutely no power. It doesn't really run drug trials itself. It just kind of rubber stamps the trials of the big pharmaceutical companies that will themselves run. There's been very <coughs> exposed to the behavior of big pharma, which are absolutely shocking reading, that if the results aren't going their way, they will just not publish the trials. If the results are going their way, they'll stop the trial early to make sure it doesn't, the case doesn't go downhill after a certain time. And there are, I forgot to bring the, the references, I'm, I'm sorry about that, about various exposes of how big pharma have behaved um, clinically behaved in terms of, you know, uh, testing of the drugs, of course, they've behaved badly at the sales end. Look at the opioid crisis in the U.S., um, the Victor Pasaka family, uh, you know, basically having to pay out billions for propagating all that misery on the citizens of New York. So Big Pharma, it's a bit like, well, in one sense, Big Pharma is great because they put lots of money into research and development and uh, 
if you're um, contracting a particularly nasty illness, Big Pharma might come to the rescue. Um, but it's a kind of double-edged sword because there is all lots of dirty practice in, in Big Pharma. So, so one explanation of the mental health crisis is it's all just fueled by Big Pharma. There's an interesting kind of uh, allegiance between anti-vaxxers and anti-experts and uh, people of that ilk and climate denialists being anti-Big Pharma, which those people are. Um, but also there are other people who are anti-Big Pharma who don't share that background, so we're kind of coming together of different views on Big Pharma. So, uh, there are other exposés on, uh, I mean, the, uh, antidepressants, SSRIs, Big Pharma, <laughs> well, several of them developed their own SSRIs and went around, won the drug. It's all, depression is all about low serotonin levels. This just increases the, you know, the serotonin <coughs> level and that's a cure for depression. Then, of course, there were suicides occurring, which desperately tried to um, not come out. They knew about it very early on. Um, and also, it turns out that for about a third of people, SSRIs have absolutely no, absolutely no help whatsoever. About a third is kind of mixed health, and a third report success. And now even Big Pharma doesn't stand behind the science behind SSRIs. It's a bit like electroconvulsive therapy now. It's drugs, <coughs> but we have absolutely no idea why. If you take SSRIs, it takes ages, it increases your serotonin levels straight away. So how come, how come there's a lag before you start to feel better? There are new theories about depression, and one is the inflammation theory. I think SSRIs developed from, from antihistamines, which have a kind of anti-inflammatory effect. There's a feeling that what's really doing all the work is anti-inflammatory drugs. <coughs> treat depression and, and SSRIs are just one of that family. Uh, so we could talk a lot about Big Pharma, good and bad. What we need to do is dig a bit deeper when it comes to mental health, and we need to look at the very, very famous Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental, Dis mental Disorders. I'm not sure when DSM-6 is coming out, I guess fairly soon. It takes uh, eight, nine, ten years for the, the different manuals to come out. Here's the definition of a mental disorder in DSM-5, a serious deviation from expected cognitive, social, and emotional development. Sounds wonderfully benign, doesn't it? But once you think about, well, what counts as a deviation? What's social development? Okay, these are all incredibly vague terms, and yet it's the Bible for psychiatrists and mental health practitioners, particularly in the US. Uh, I don't think psychiatrists in the UK are bound by it, though they do dip into it, and it's a great source of information. It's got bigger, it's got more uh, detail. Let's have a look at it. I'm going to rattle through these just to give you a sense of what's in there. If someone was diagnosed in infancy, mental retardation, ADHD, delirium, dementia, Alzheimer's, mental disorders, age-related psychosis, substance-related disorders, alcoholism is an interesting one. Lots of recovering alcoholics go, yes, I knew all along I was ill. Okay, I've got an illness, perhaps genetic. I know lots of alcoholics. <laughs> so, okay. I hear their voices ringing in my ears a lot. Some, some, of them are, some recovering alcoholics are relieved to find it's an illness, indeed a mental illness. They embrace that, and some don't. So um, there's much more to be said about alcoholism. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the illness uh, <laughs> either in your own substance abuse <laughs> or in someone you know. Schizophrenia, familiar and other psychotic disorders, delusional disorder. I'm just giving some examples as a whole list of psychotic disorders. Uh, mood disorders, major depressive disorder, standard depression, bipolar disorder. Those of you who've got bipolar disorder know it, it you know these are very these are very going back to that non-specific specific distinction that bipolar disorder isn't really that useful as a diagnostic label anymore because there are so many subcategories of bipolar disorder which are really quite different. Likewise for schizophrenia. Generalized anxiety disorder, people find it very surprising when you tell them I've got depression and generalized anxiety disorder at the same time. Okay, how can you be down enough at the same time? Well, that's the 
nature of these people in certain presentations. So to form disorders, the body dysmorphic uh, issues, factitious disorders, Munchausen syndrome and, and delusional disorders. Dissociative disorders, who am I? Is this part of my body? Sexual and gender identity disorders, eating disorders, sleep disorders, and something else is really a useful label there. Kleptomania, impulse control disorders, uh, perhaps Tourette's syndrome would go under that one, adjustment disorder, uh, personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, not meant to be buddied with that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I think it might be a derivative disorder. I think it's one where you may be taking another medication and it causes involuntary movements, but it does affect speech as well. Um, this is just a capsule. I mean, child abuse isn't really a disorder, though, though um, it's a kind of, it's part of the etiology of certain disorders. Here's my favorite self defeating personality disorder. <laughs> I have that. <laughs> <laughs> Today I nearly crashed the car, I nearly gave up, I nearly cancelled. You sabotage your friendships, your relationships, your plans, you never really achieve anything. <laughs> so I can't wait till the DSM puts that in, because it's not in at the moment, and then some big pharmaceutical company <laughs> will invent a pill that they can give me, and I'll be fine. <laughs> Perfection disorder, philosophers have that. <laughs> Dyspraxia, non-level learning disorder. Non-level learning disorder uh, is a funny one. You would think that think about being a kind of cognitive dyslexia. It's sort of fallen out of favour. It was waxed and waned, and the practitioners get together to decide what stays in, what doesn't stay in, what way to give more detail. But non-level learning disorder seems to be a genuine disorder. I'm not so sure about self defeating personality disorder, that's just me not being able to, you know, run my life properly, but the, the non-level learning disorder does seem like a genuine disorder. Perfection disorder uh, is maybe not a disorder in itself, it's perhaps symptomatic of other, other disorders. People who perfectionists are very hard on themselves, you know, they, they never look for the good, they always look for the bad, they often have OCD and so forth, and lots of philosophers have perfection disorder. Um, kind of cognitive perfectionism, it's actually very toxic. Okay, so let's think a bit more about the DSM-5. A lot of these quotes come from around about the time the DSM-5 came out. How long do I have? I get the feeling I'm running out of time. We have about like five more minutes, so. Okay. <laughs> Here's the BBC, very trustworthy. <laughs> Diagnosing psychiatric illness has always been controversial, and mental health, mental health experts say, now some are aware of the new draft of the Diagnostic, Diagnostic Bible, the mental health medicine could result in almost everyone being diagnosed with a mental condition. So round about this time, there was just a flurry, and I've got all the quotes if you want me to send you the slides, please ask for them. But everybody started to think, let's blame the DSM. It's over to apologize. <coughs> so one thing might be you go to the doctor and you're, uh, I'm not sure this in this quote, you exhibit you know, grief. And it's normal and natural to exhibit grief, perhaps profound grief. The Queen Victoria grieved for 25 years, for God's sake. You know, that's the Queen of England. So grief is a very normal, humane, um, non-pathological feeling. But there's been some thinking, well, maybe, you know, let's take grief as a counter-indication out. Oh, they're not really depressed because they're, they're grieving. That was the original thought. Well, maybe we need to rethink grief. And so, of course, if you do take it out as a counter-indication of mental illness, that will explain why you're changing the concept and more people end up being ill, and hence the mental health crisis, in part at least, would be explained by this more relaxed and inclusive definition of the concept. Um, one of the most frightening scenarios is the potential for medicating people, particularly children, who haven't yet shown any signs of illness and a bit to treat them. 
starting from 2012. The main focus has been the broadening of psychiatric diagnoses, making an increased range of behaviors targets of psychiatric concern. One in four US citizens last year took a psychiatric drug. Maybe that's gone up since 2012. One in four. Similar percentage in the UK, I think in Spain. For example, it's been proposed that relief should be dropped and we've talked about that. In the case of severe mental illness, the discovery that a large proportion of the population, about 10%, sometimes experience subclinical hallucinations and bizarre beliefs, has led to the inclusion of attenuated psychosis syndrome. Another thing that one of the sort of indications of a disorder is excessive rumination. There's actually Chinese medicine too, but every philosopher would be mentally ill uh, with excessive rumination because that's all I do when I wake up and I go to sleep, I just ruminate. Okay. Uh, mental health diagnosis is so common, is crazy that you're normal. This is Robert Bremsky, a psychologist in New York, author of Crazy Notes on the Master Couch. Take a look at the current DSM, it's massive. If we have a copy, an electronic copy in the library, it'd be a lot of time to kill. There are some design, benign diagnosis, diagnoses in there, at least one for pretty much everyone out there, including myself. So it looks like there's lots of people saying about the DSM, haha, it's the DSM's fault. And it goes on. Uh, in his new book, Saving Normal, an insider revolt against out of control psychiatric diagnosis, DSM 5, Big Pharma, and the medicalization of ordinary life. He argues that normal event, life events are now being branded as mental disorders. While at the same time, this is the crucial bit, while at the same time, people who desperately need help are not getting it. So in one sense, you might think, remember that kind of relief feeling, oh, I'm kind of glad that I'm now categorized as mental ill. I feel relieved, I can, there's a diagnostic label, I, can, I need treatment. There's a kind of way in which uh, in, an increase in, a, a broadening of the concept can help you. But other people may not be helped by broadening of the concept because they may say, look, I am seriously ill, that person is not. It's, it's, there's, a, there's resource issues attached to this change in concept. Okay. Not just the Guardian, sometimes I read the Telegraph. <laughs> you need to read all different sides. Is the Daily Storm out, of course? <laughs> Gary Greenberg, 56, is a US psychotherapist with 30 years of experience and a prolific writer on mental illness. Um, psychiatric Bible, what does he say? Oh yes, so, uh, whoops. <coughs> One skeptical thought you can have about the DSM is it doesn't really have a great track record because homosexuality was classified in earlier versions of the DSM as a mental illness and you would have all sorts of different recommendations to normalize your sexual behavior or sexual preferences. DSM, okay? So maybe you could say, well, that was the old DSM. The new DSM is absolutely fine. It's changed its ways. But not to give you pause for thought, homosexuality was listed as a sociopathic personality disorder in 1952, and it's, that's, it stood in the various later versions until 1973. Okay. Doctors were paid to treat it. Scientists, respectable scientists, what are you, research, what are you researching? Well, the underlying uh, pathology of homosexuality. Speaking at a conference, big wigs in the 1950s making, making their name researching homosexuality in that way. Gay people underwent countless therapies, including electric shocks, years on the couch, behavior modification, etc. etc. So the DSM, the now people call it the, the Bible of psychiatric disorders, certainly went through some earlier incarnations which were pretty grim. This relates, of course, to the politicization of mental health. Some of you may or may not know that uh, if you are ideologically unsound in Soviet Russia, that wasn't like, oh, you've just got some confused theory about, go, go read Karl Marx, you're just a bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're mentally ill. Why? Because Karl Marx is blindingly, obviously true. So if you stare at those words and you don't understand it and nod your head and agree, there's something cognitively wrong with you. You're suffering from ideological deviance. Indeed, the name that they used was sluggish schizophrenia. And indeed, the politicization of mental health occurs in various places today. So 
Uh, and indeed, it occurs in Western societies in lots of subtle ways. So the DSM can be used, and they can, they can consult the DSM and twist it and bound it to their political needs. So there's an issue about that. Uh, these, are, these are different reactions to the mental health crisis. So we looked at Big Pharma, now we're sort of broadening things up a bit. Well, it might be that uh, we always need to bear in mind that there are commercial interests, there are other sinister interests, there are uh, physical interests at work. One of the great uh, leaders in the 1960s, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk about how the treatment model of mental illness changed, was R.D. Lang, not K.D. Lang, R.D. Lang, uh, maverick psychiatrist. He treated the stars. He was momentarily the kind of psychiatrist for people like Sean Connery in, in Hollywood. He, there is a biography of him. Um, he's an exceedingly interesting man, but also just horrible. I mean, he clearly had some kind of narcissistic personality disorder. He was a terrible father, um, alcoholic, and uh, so that's not a bad thing, but he just, one of those intriguing people that is kind of both devil and angel in the same way. But he did pioneer these, uh, something called, along with other psychiatrists at the time, the anti-hospital. So we don't want to medicalize men. These people want to swing the other way and say, there isn't a mental health crisis. In fact, there's a lot less mental illness around than you might think, or you might as well just say we're all mental illness. It's a useless term. So in a very famous, uh, this allegedly took place, there was someone exhibiting sort of classic signs of dissociation and so forth, rocking backwards and forwards, and he went up to them and just rocked backwards and forwards with them. And so eventually he got a smile, and he was able to somehow, he had this uncanny ability, to communicate with patients who had never previously responded to him very much at all. Um, and he was one of these people that opposed applying the medical model to mental illness, he just thought, look, these, these people are maybe maladapted, and of course they're going to look pretty grim and ill in this terrible asylum, you know, there's nothing to do. So that was the beginning of thinking that we need to stop locking people up in padded cells. And a lot of people back then were just drugged 24 7. There was no treatment, there was just kind of making sure everything ran smoothly like a prison. So <coughs> I, I, I encourage you to, to check out that, you're a fascinating character. I think when he did, he did this rebirthing exercise for Sean Connery, and Sean Connery paid him with a bottle of whiskey, which they then proceeded to drink together. It makes it Sean Connery wandering around the streets as a man who's allegedly, well, he does play golf, but allegedly has a house in London. The, the most famous person, more famous than Lang, I guess, though, he wasn't read, people just thought that Sass is just this kind of hippie, 50s, 60s guy. He didn't think the medical model applied to mental illnesses at all. He didn't think there were any mental illnesses. They just ghost, ghost things. If, if something's an illness, it has to have an underlying causal unity. And mental illness doesn't have that. And indeed, uh, people have tried to scan brains and look for kind of various features, underlying features of mental illness. And that's an ongoing research program. But Zaz anticipated all of this by saying, if there's no physical substrate, then there's no illness. Neurodiversity, you may have heard of this. This is one explanation. I'm going to finish in like two minutes. Um, neurodiversity is um, the idea that yes, there is a, there's a kind of mental health crisis taking place. It's due to improved science, but we shouldn't maybe taxonomize the people with these various uh, illnesses or disabilities or impairments as in the same way. These are just there's neurodiversity. So Tourette's syndrome, um, you might think of that as you're not really ill, you're just different. And uh, Elizabeth Barnes has a great book about disability called The Minority Body. You should think of disability as just like being a, a member of a minority. Transposing her thought to mental illness is just, you've just, you just got the minority mind. It's not like, so this is a way of saying, well, maybe after all, you're not really ill, you're just a member of a cognitive minority. You just think and respond differently. That actually works quite well for things like the autism spectrum disorder, Tourette's syndrome. But it isn't much use for some illnesses because some people want to say, and the right seems to be rightly so, I am ill. 
You know, it's, it's not about neurodiversity with me. I don't want to be like this. I need a cure. There's something seriously wrong with me. I am, uh, so, so the neurodiversity accent doesn't work. Last slide. So far, we've let society off the hook. We've blamed, in a way, of course, we might just blame Big Pharma like it's part of society or over medicalization. We go back to the medical model of disease, which thinks, well, it's all about your locus of disease. Go back to that speech therapist who says, no, we need a broader understanding of the causes of mental illness. Let there be a mental health crisis taking place at the moment. The first hypotheses for why that might be could be to do with things out with you. Social media, okay, social media, a good force. So there is some uh, research on social media that, it, that uh, in certain patients, at least certain cases, at least, it, it has a kind of uh, reinforces depression and the rest. So we don't need to let society off the hook. Society itself may be diseased. We need to rethink the medical model, as it's just speculative thoughts at the end. You could do so in two different ways. You could think, no, let the locus of disease be individuals, and let's just have a broader conception of the etiology of disease. You know, we, always, we always allow toxins to, you know, if, you, if you drink lots of lead, uh, if you inject lots of lead, then it will cause certain diseases and certain illnesses which are readily identifiable. So here's, there might be other toxins, <coughs> social toxins, which you're breathing in. Uh, so we need to expand the etiology of disease. Or we need to rethink the nature of disease and don't think it's just as determined by the innards of you. That there are other things that could be the bearers of disease, institutions, societies, groups, political movements, dangerously close to the Soviet idea, perhaps. So that <coughs> hypothesis, it seems to me, has been ignored because people have been blaming the DSM as in blaming practitioners. But we need to be very careful because there can be other explanations of why there is the mental health crisis. Thanks for coming. Check out the counselling service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you're all here, right? <laughs> so, so they are actually excellent. Um, and they have, let's say, I think 200 points a month. So um, if you need help, Sabo in part to belong to the scientific tradition which says that no, no reality to mental illness if there isn't some underlying you know, physical manifestation. So it's a bit like scientism, it's saying, look, if, if neuroscience and brain imaging can kind of find some pathology and image it, um, and that can be correlated with it, the um, presentation of certain symptoms, then we'll have the beginnings of what Saz wanted. Saz, Saz was kind of, that was his definition, and he was a bit of a pessimist about whether or not we'd ever get there. But now we seem to be, have some of the technology to perhaps get there. Um, normality, I mean, there's the, you know, 
normal distributions that you used in those surveys. But they, you know, the definition in the DSM is deviance from expected norms and normality. That's a much more value-laden <coughs> conception. So what, what there really is is the kind of battle which has always taken place, I guess, between those who think illness and indeed mental illness is a natural kind versus those, those who think, well, it doesn't have to be a natural kind. It could be a social construct. No less real for that, no less uh, in need of treatment and the rest, but just something where this value-laden conception of normality can play a bigger role uh, not in undermining whether or not there's mental illness, but actually in telling us what it might be in certain cases. Does that help? It does, thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, and then we go over there. Hi, thank you, Mitchell. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about your point about mental illness as a perception of Munchausen. Um, I mean, Munchausen syndrome is just in the DSM as a particular kind of um, disorder. I just use it as an example, um, an example of disorder. I mean, I'm not an expert in Munchausen syndrome by proxy, by proxy version of it. Um, if, I mean, the DSM is put together by a panel of experts and they all sort of vote. So there's always going to be a bit of a detractor in that voting system about whether or not something should go in. My understanding is that Munchausen syndrome has been in from a very early time as a schizophrenia, but there are much more uh, dubious or debatable or whether disagreement over other, other illnesses. I think Munchausen syndrome is, I don't know enough about it, but I think that's been in various incarnations of the DSM as something which is less disputed as a kind of a recognizable disorder symptomatically. Um, though perhaps we lack a complete theory of treatment and we lack a complete theory of the underlying pathology in, in the sense that Zaz wanted. Do you have anything to say about my choices? What is that? The, the, the point you're trying to make or convey there is that we have certain illnesses that are more open minded, more cautious within the history of the DSM. Well, I think there are different axes of respectability. I think Munchausen's has a certain veneer of respectability because the word and the term has been kicking around for a while. Yeah. That doesn't actually mean it is respectable. It's just got lodged in our taxonomy. It may be thrown out. Some of the, some of the disorders have been thrown out and some have been redefined. Um, from schizophrenia, it's probably the one that's undergone the most conceptual turmoil. Um, we're kind of non-experts looking in on the DSM, thinking, okay, we sort of have to trust it because it's the one that is used by the leading professionals. Um, but like I was trying to get across, if you, you do, it doesn't take much research to find that it has a very controversial history. Its function is odd. It's big pharma loves the DSM because the more you can medicalize people's everyday behavior, you can make billions of pounds of money out of, out of that. So it has a very uh, light and dark presence in our understanding of mental health treatment. We don't know whether to like it or love it or hate it. Munchausen's, I'd have to check whether, what this particular status of that is, whether it's about to be refined, whether it's about to be ditched, whether it's staying. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, we, we, we have the time for one more question and we'll let you have them. The best paper to read on that is, is Strawson's paper, Freedom and Resentment, where he talks about the different um, react reactive attitudes, as he put it, with different sorts of behavior. Um, 
think he really gets the idea from Kant in a way. It's like you're either treating someone as an agent with free will, in which case you'll praise and blame, or you look at them as someone who's non-agential, who's not free. He uses the case of the kleptomaniac. You're absolutely right to highlight this question because the DSM has a role to play in the legal context because experts can pull out the DSM and say, well, my client was beyond their control, they're suffering from uh, self defeating personality disorder. <laughs> <laughs> and so therefore, the fact that something happened, they can't be held responsible. So, so insofar as we can connect the free will debate with the responsibility debate, which is exactly what Chaucer wants to do in that debate, that he thinks, look, let's use our intuitions about responsibility and praise and blame, and they're kind of the presence of reactive attitudes, then that's informed by medical diagnoses like that Okay, thank you. So we're, uh, thanks everyone for asking some questions. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple of people to give us some quick announcements. Uh, Marina, can help out? Um,
uh, <laughs> that is KSK6. And uh, yeah, I'd be also very happy to have you uh, on my team. And also, yeah, it would be really great to have people from uh, all, like, so even undergrads, even freshers, but also like master's students, because we want to have a team with various different skill sets and backgrounds. And yeah. No, no, no. 